Uh, now I will welcome uh, Dr. Mark Hennigus from Define. He will talk about security aspects um, in real-world applications. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. I trust you will let me know if you cannot see me or cannot see the slides. By means of introduction, my name is Mark. I'm the manager in the blockchain practice here at Define. Uh, as such, I've been involved in several blockchain-related projects such as tokenization, paper use, central bank digital currencies, and also identity solutions. And with my talk today, I would like to encourage you to view self-sovereign identity as a great opportunity to enhance any processes that involve identities or even communication between different parties. Now, my talk is titled uh, SSI in real-world applications um, and the limits of them and how to overcome those. And I would like to start with the question, why should we talk about that today? Well, may have, some of you may have heard of proof of concepts around SSI. And now, finally, we are at a point in time where we can finally take that to a level where we talk about live applications. Because um, the COVID-19 use case is all around us. Uh, we need credentials for vaccination, for recovery, for test results. And we need those at a scalable, interoperable, and most importantly, at a GDPR compliant level. And secondly, uh, the SSI services that are out there are now at a maturity level where we can actually take them to build live applications. For instance, the underlying ledger technologies like Hyperledger Indy or the ARIES framework or the existing consortia like ID Union or the Sovereign Network and even software providers, uh, just to name a few, there's Trinsic or Evernum or here in Germany, we have Sferity or Azatus or Lissi. Uh, and all these together now form um, uh, the opportunity for us to take existing use cases that are very pressing and build live software and live solutions with that. And uh, this, this has led to the fact that more and more governments and organizations are looking into self-sovereign identity. To name a few, there's the Good Health Pass, there's COVIDcreds.org or the ID2020 Network uh, Consortium. And uh, the first pilots are actually going live now based on SSI, for instance, the IATA use case for air travel uh, or governments like Singapore and British Columbia and Canada are taking SSI-based solutions live. So this is why we need to talk about SSI live applications. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard so much about SSI, I would just have I would just have to like, uh, well, one slide here to, to introduce you to what actually happens here. Um, we have three major roles in this framework. We have the credential issuer who will write a, a sort of signature on a shared ledger, which can be a blockchain, but doesn't have to be. Uh, and based on the signature, they then can send verified credentials to individuals who are the holder in this diagram here. And they will then have these credentials on their smartphones. And for this process here, there's no blockchain transaction involved just for the once for this, this, one, this, this one operation at the beginning to write the signature. Then finally, if the verifier, for instance, an airport here, uh, would like to see uh, the credential issued to the holder, they would ask for the presentation. And now by looking at the shared ledger and by reading the signature written by the issuer, they can then make sure that the, um, that the credential that, that they have been presented with uh, has actually not been tempered with by the holder and has actually been issued in exact in this way as uh, the holder has claimed by that very issuer as the holder has claimed. So this is what happens. Now let's look at a few limits of this framework. And the first one becomes obvious when we look at the so-called trust triangle over here. Again, we see the issuer and the verifier, and we see the holder at the bottom and the credential issuance and presentation here. And we see a third bar here, which is which I have labeled trust. That is because the verifier needs to trust the issuer uh, as to uh, that they actually are who they claim to be. Um, to take a Small step back, let's look at what is in scope of, S, uh, of SSI. So the framework provides me with the answers to certain questions. When I receive a verifiable presentation as a verifier, I can ask which did has actually, so which decentralized identifier has actually issued the credential? Was it issued only to the holder and has it been tempered with and has it been revoked? And I will refer to these questions as verification. But there's also sorts of things that are out of scope of the SSI framework. And this is just a selection. But for issuers, it is, what do I have to put into a credential? And am I actually allowed to issue this type of credential? For holders, it might be, 
How much information do I have to share with a verifier? What can they actually ask for? And perhaps most importantly for the verifiers, they need to know who is this issuer. If you think of every restaurant in the world keeping a list of all the vaccination centers in the world, this is not really feasible. This doesn't scale. Um, they need to know what content do I have to ask for or does the credential actually fit the holder? And I will refer to these kinds of questions as validation. And what often happens is that SSI-based solutions now need a centralized component to answer these questions of validation. And in my next slide, I have brought an example of how this could actually be done. Again, on this slide, you see the two roles of the certificate issuer and the verifier, but uh, they are now not directly connected with a trust bar anymore, but I have introduced a third role, which we, let, let's call them an administrator here. And these, administrator basically, these administrators basically, they have some sort of authority over issuers, they can tell them what to do, and then they can tell verifiers whether they can trust someone or not. And what their job would be, well, first of all, they could create and maintain a policy for issuers, what they can issue and what it has to look like, create templates and tell them what has to be in there. Then secondly, they can create and maintain a registry, a trust registry, containing all the decentralized identifiers of all the issuers that verifiers can trust. And verifiers can then simply ask the administrator through the trust registry, hey, I've seen a credential here and it is issued by DID so-and-so, can I trust this DID? And they will then receive the answer yes or no. And then there's one other arrow here to other administrators, and that is because this may be a closed ecosystem. This can just be, for instance, Germany, or it can just be um, all the restaurants in Germany. So you may have to talk to other administrators of other ecosystems that make sure that uh, you actually have their trusted agents in your trust registry as well, and they have yours and perhaps you want to standardize issuance policies and so forth. So these, uh, this communication is very important between administrators of ecosystems. So this would be one way to, uh, to overcome this first limit that validation is not actually in scope of SSI. There is a second uh, challenge here, and that is paper-based credentials, because not everyone has a smartphone and not everyone can keep their credential with them on their smartphone. And here's why you usually need one. Um, all this SSI-based behavior is, is uh, very interactive. So if you look at issuer, holder, and verifier, and if you look at the process from top to down, holders and issuers have to create a connection such that issuers can send the credential to the holders. They have to accept the credential. For verifiers, they have to establish a second connection. They have to select which credential they want to share, which claims in this, which attributes in this credential to share, and then finally send it. And that is why holders and all the others as well are usually represented by so-called agents, which will manage their communication for them. And all this interactive behavior is very hard to do with paper credentials. However, there is a few ways around that. There is, uh, for instance, the idea that you can carry around, around login information to a cloud agent with you. So this cloud agent holds your credentials. And if someone asks you for a presentation, you would just basically log into that cloud at a terminal that is provided by a verifier, select what you want to share, and then log out again. The second idea would be that you actually print out the QR code, a QR code that represents the credential itself. So all the information in the credential, name, date of birth, for the vaccination case, for instance, which vaccination was used and so forth, which brand and so forth. Um, and you would have that in your QR code and you would carry it around with you and present that to a verifier. And the last one is not that far away from this one. You can also pre-create a presentation, which is already ready to present it to people and then basically skip the step of select what you want to share, but you carry around a ready presentation, which will make the verification smoother and faster. However, all these three solutions up here, they come with drawbacks. First of all, there's the security. If you lose your QR code here, then you actually use information about, lose information about yourself. So someone else finds this and they may be able to use your identity somewhere. Or in this case down here, where you pre-create a presentation, you may not be able to to select what you want to share with a, with a verifier. You always share everything. So this limited sharing becomes uh, compromised. And then finally, self-sovereign identity is very much about you being in charge of your credentials and you choosing where you want to store them. So the local storage in case of this cloud solution up here would be compromised. And in a way, all these solutions here can be seen as somehow compromising some SSI, uh, SSI specific aspects. 
However, um, if you think about them as being a solution to include non-digital natives in a very futuristic, very modern and very interactive framework, um, it doesn't seem so bad anymore to go these uh, to go for these drawbacks here uh, because you can also combine them and choose very, very carefully the solution that fits best to your use case. So now we've covered um, the paper credentials and we've covered the out of scope items of uh, SSI. Let's look at um, a very important aspect. It's about infrastructure change and what I would have to consider uh, in the future or regarding the credentials themselves. Now for this, let's go away from the credential use case and look at passports. In the today's world, what would happen is we have an international organization that creates international standards for passport documents. They would tell governments what to put in them, and these governments then will create safety features and include these safety features into these credentials. The government will also train border and, uh, agents and tell them what to look for in a credential. Um, to, they, they would have to know, is this a real government that has issued the passport? And is this passport actually legit? So the verification and validation they do is based on the credential itself and on knowledge of border agents about the credentials and about the issuers of those credentials. So, and that is the reason why today forging a credential is a crime. I could try to trick a border agent into believing that I'm someone that I'm actually not, and they might let me into a country where I'm not supposed to be. Um, and they can also make human errors and let me in despite the fact that they're not actually supposed to. So that is the major process, how, how it works today on a very high level. Uh, and now I would like to show you what this could, how this could change if you use self-sovereign identity. Um, you would still have international standards, of course, that would go into the uh, verifiable credentials. Um, and the, the first thing you see is that the safety features are no, no longer here. The, the safety now comes from the infrastructure within the SSI framework. And what is new is this set of validation rules over here. So the border agent wouldn't have to know whether they can trust the credential, but they would ask the government infrastructure and would tell them, look, this is the credential I've been presented, or this is the issuer DID that has created this credential. Can I trust that? And the government will then answer yes or no. So the verification and validation is now based on the technological SSI framework on standardized issuance policies and on the availability of a validation framework. And here's a, a major change. Forged credentials are just simply of no use. If I issued a credential to you that says that you are someone you're not and you were to present that to a border agent, they would easily recognize that as not being valid because I'm not a legit issuer. So. Um, the decisions they take are simply driven by technology. They cannot make any more uh, mistakes here by misreading a document or something like that. And they will make sure that this, this framework will make sure um, that they always know whether they can trust the credential or not. And this is what I would refer to as a shift from security in the issuance process towards security in the validation process. So when we look at infrastructure for credentials, uh, today and tomorrow, we might see a shift of being very much focused on safety features and at the credentials themselves, and in the future more um, towards uh, creating a validation framework for border agents or for any verifier uh, that makes sure um, that in a very secure and very fast and very available way, these uh, verifiers get access to the information whether they can trust the credential or not. So these are the three major limits, I would call them, uh, of uh, SSI uh, that I wanted to mention. Um, those were three very full slides, so I have summarized this again over here. Um, so first of all, we had the uh, out-of-scope items that you would need to cover if you want to overcome the limits of SSI today. The last thing I told you was uh, the redesign of the infrastructure. SSI is really not built for uh, infrastructure aspects as we have them today. We're very much focused on credential issuance and less so on the validation and verification framework. So we would have to look at that. And thirdly, we need to address non-digital natives because not everyone has a smartphone. And we can do that, the first two, by introducing an additional centralized role that creates a framework for issuers and a framework for verifiers. 
and this uh, inclusion of non-digital natives we would uh, cover by introducing hybrid solutions with and without SSI or by using paper-based credentials or perhaps by using cloud wallets uh, for feature phone users or for people who have uh, login information with them. And what is very important is this last part here. Uh, whenever we overcome these limits as they are and they exist today, we want to make sure that we leverage existing standards and also the community-driven approaches that may come tomorrow. Because the SSI community continuously works on uh, improvements to the SSI framework. Just to name a few, there would be uh, chained credentials in the future and delegations. So the um, the government of Germany could hand out credentials to all the vaccination centers and tell them, yes, you are indeed a trusted vaccination center. And they, those vaccination centers will then base the uh, handed out credentials on this credential. And uh, hence, uh, any verifier wouldn't have to trust the vaccination center anymore, but only the did the DID, the, the identifier of the government. And there's more like images and biometric features and credentials or context uh, in schemas and messages, uh, which will make it easier to use the framework in every life uh, applications and the near future. Um, I would like to uh, go forward actually. All right, I would like to, uh, to go to this slide as well and show you why it is a good time to start a project uh, in SSI as of today. First of all, there is a shift uh, in demand in the market. Uh, it's not just me. I've seen it a lot with others as well. We're all sick and tired of having a thousand passwords with us. We would really much rather identify ourselves in a different way that is way more convenient. Um, if you started today, you could participate in a very young community, which is always very important in the blockchain context because there's always shared infrastructure. And if you can influence the way how it changes and the path to where it's going that is very important and you can now participate very early in that. Um, you can make use of a very powerful technology. It's not just about issuing credentials. There's an entire technology around that. For instance, DITCOM that will make transferring messages very, very secure. And finally, uh, these features that I've shown you that are missing that, that you would have to build, it's not like this is going to go away. There will always be enhancing features necessary um, that you actually need to build uh, and you can make use of any of, what you, any of what you build today, you can make use of that tomorrow. So looking at what kind of value infrastructure providers can add today, that would of course be easy onboarding to existing infrastructure, creating secure processes and perhaps secure holder wallets. And if you're any organization at all that would like to uh, create value with SSI today, um, well, just uh, use the, the power of uh, techn the technology and uh, make use of no more passwords or easy onboarding of new clients. So as I said at the beginning, I would really like to encourage you to look at this technology as a, as a way to improve things uh, around processes with identity and with communication. And before I close, I would like to use the last couple of seconds just quickly to introduce you to the firm where I work. Those of you who have been in the last... Uh, uh, talks here may have seen a slide similar to this before. We're a European consultancy, and I guess what makes us very special is that we have this hands-on approach where we work on, pro uh, on, on pro uh, projects in a way where we combine the business analyst and the programmer role, and this is where our experience actually comes from. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have lots of fun at the rest of the conference, and I hope to see some of you in real life very soon. Thanks, and bye-bye. Uh, thank you, but uh, we have received one question from our Telegram channel. All right. Um, so uh, the question is, um, are paper-based uh, credentials also relevant for CBDCs? Which also, I think, leads to our next uh, presentation, but <laughs> uh, feel free to, to give your answer. Right. Um, so... Uh, in a way, yes, um, because when it comes to CBDC, it's always a design decision, of course. Uh, but as long as you need identity and the information on who has actually been part of a transaction, which may be relevant in some CBDC transactions, then you need the question of who issued this transaction, who created this trans transaction, who sent the money. And if that is necessary, then, of course, as well, in, in this case, as in any other, we need to include non-digital natives. And if we go for a decentralized digital identity, 
um, then of course we cannot just use smartphones uh, and uh, exclude all the non-digital natives. We have to include them and we may need paper processes for that as well. But this is really just the connection here. Um, if it's about identity, then yes, we may need these paper credentials here. Um, for CBDCs, we can also consider that perhaps uh, a wallet that you want to have could not be in your smartphone, but could be paper-based. But this is really a design question of the future. Okay, yeah. Thank, I, thank you. And uh, I think that will be uh, a good answer um, and response uh, to this question.